Yeah, I see the title, man. This is story. Camille. Chances are you have no idea who this man is. But over nah, 50 years ago, Camille made a decision that would change <laughs> the NBA as we know it. See, Camille was a professional soccer player in his home country of Cameroon in the late 60s, and he was good. For two years, Camille traveled the country playing the sport he loved at one of the highest levels. But his father wasn't a fan of sports and saw soccer as an activity for those who couldn't succeed in other areas of their life. So just as his soccer career was taking off, he had to retire to focus on a more respected career in politics and local government. Fast forward two decades, and Camille would go on to be the chief to a small town just outside of Yaoundé, Cameroon. And throughout his life, Camille grew quite the family, 10 children in total, one of them you might be familiar with, named Luke Mbamute. Luke, just like his father, loved soccer. His dream was to one day play professionally like his dad did. Do you guys know who this player that he's speaking of is? I have no idea. We're going to see, though. And growing up, Luke would focus on soccer and play the game almost exclusively until about the age of 13, where one day, while on his way to soccer practice, Luke noticed a basketball court that usually sat empty was being used by other local kids. For the next few days, every time he passed the court, these boys were shooting hoops. And slowly, mm. Luke's curiosity got the best of him. So later that week, when no one was around, he grabbed his soccer ball, headed to practice, but this time, he stopped at the empty basketball court and took a shot. And that was it. He was hooked. For the next 10 years, Luke gave up soccer to focus on basketball. He quickly rose through the ranks in Cameroon's youth system and even gained the attention of college Let's scouts go. in the United States. My boy took that first shot with like, nah, it's, I'm fucking with this right here. You know what I'm saying? I'm fucking with this joint right here. You know what I mean? <laughs> After being selected to be a part of Cameroon's national youth basketball team, eventually earning a scholarship to play basketball at UCLA. His parents were reluctant to send their boy to the US, but remembering the difficult decision he had to make because of his father, Camille didn't want to stop his son from pursuing his dreams in sports. And so in 2004, Luke moved to the US and soon after enrolled at UCLA on a basketball scholarship. And four years later, after a decorated college career, Luke would become just the third player in his country's history to be selected mm. in the NBA draft. But this story That's doesn't tough. end here. Because throughout his NBA career, That's Luke tough. would frequently travel back to Cameroon to visit family and host his own basketball camp. And it was at his camp in 2011 where he discovered possibly the next great Cameroonian basketball player. A tall, lanky kid who just picked up the sport a few months prior had no real skill or finesse, but had all the potential in the world. His real passion was volleyball, and he was supposed to move to France later that year to play professionally. But Luke knew this kid was special. So under Luke's mentorship, the teenage prospect continued to develop his skills and moved to the U.S. just one year later in pursuit of his basketball dreams. In the U.S., he enrolled at one of the best prep basketball programs oh. in the country. And Who is this, who is that? became one of the most sought after recruits, growing to seven feet tall, watching tapes of Akeem Olajuwon to improve his game, and even earning himself a full ride to play at the University of Kansas. But not even Luke could have predicted just how fast he would excel. His game was getting better almost by the day. His potential was seemingly unlimited. And after just one season in college, the 20 year old Cameroonian recruit would enter the 2014 NBA draft where oh, he was so, selected oh, okay. with the know. third overall pick. <laughs> His name, Joel Embiid, the greatest Cameroonian oh, player. <laughs> That's crazy, yo, bro. I'm thinking like, yo, bro, do we know this guy or not, bro? What's going on here? Damn, I, I bet. Yeah, I ain't gonna lie. My boy Jimmy Hyrule got some great storytelling abilities within the video. Uh, 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 In NBA context, history, I guess you could say. one man giving up his sports dreams over 50 years ago triggered a series of events that would eventually lead to two others having the opportunity to live out theirs. If Luke Mba Mute never stopped at that court to take a shot on his way to practice, he might have never fell in love with the game. His journey to the NBA would have never happened. Maybe he focuses on soccer instead. He would have never hosted his basketball camps, and we would have never discovered one of the greatest players the world has ever seen. And that, ladies and gentlemen, is the butterfly effect. When a small and seemingly insignificant occurrence has rippling effects through time, leading to some mm. consequential event sometimes long after the initial event. And this is just one of many butterfly effects that would change the course of NBA history forever.
get to it, man. Let's Today's get video to is it. brought to you by Liquid IV. Get your money, get your money, get your money. Mix it up Oosh. at your local 20 per video. Click on and stay fueled with Liquid Long before the Golden State Warriors were a dynasty riddled with Hall of Famers and a generational superstar, they were, uh, not very good. The team spent the majority of two decades as one of the worst organizations in the NBA, finding themselves in the playoffs once in 18 years. Their one shining star during those years of perpetual mediocrity was a player who literally choked out the head coach. But entering the 2010s, <laughs> yeah. Golden State... We did a Latrell Spiro reaction, but I fake did some research and I, I heard about some contacts <laughs> that uh, the coach was fake disrespecting Latrell. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> like, you know what I'm saying? I don't know, you know what I'm saying? I just being a coach, he was more so just disrespecting him. You know what I'm saying? And that's a different story, you know what I'm saying? Oh, yeah. Golden State began to put together a team <laughs> that could actually compete. Lord. An electric, high-scoring guard in Monte Ellis. Ah. A star and a real inside presence with David Lee. And a baby-faced assassin by the name of Stephen Curry. This now, core group was fun. I remember um this team when I was young. You know what I'm saying? I, I only, only really remember them because I used to play with Curry a lot. And I remember David Lee used to be fucking butt, son. Well, on 2K, I'm really talking about. I'm really, <laughs> really talking about on 2K. I, I wasn't really paying attention to what was going on in the actual NBA. Fans were re-engaged, but most importantly, they were good. The only thing standing in the way of them in a playoff spot was Steph Curry's ankles. Every time the Warriors picked up steam and got on a rhythm, Steph would go down with another ankle injury. But in 2012, there was a specific injury that would alter the timeline of Steph's career and the timeline of the entire NBA. Neal dribble it off his leg. It's oh my goodness. Steph Curry, Curry hurt himself hurt his again. Ankle. Oh, this is just heartbreaking, is all I can say. <coughs> I hurt for him personally. Yeah, and certainly hurt for the first, team and the organization. Nigga Clay fell After too. getting his ankle fuck. troubles under control in his first two seasons in the league, Steph, seemingly out of nowhere, sprains his ankle against the Spurs just six games into his third year in the league. An injury that would snowball out of control and re-aggravate again and again. Unlike his sprains in the past, this one lingered, causing him to miss entire chunks of the season. Even with his military-grade ankle braces, the sprain kept creeping back up, eventually leading to a season-ending surgery just two months after his initial injury. Meanwhile, the Warriors' season was in a tailspin, and a change was desperately in need before their window on what looked like a promising group closed. A trade was in need and it would be a move that would make or break the next decade of basketball in Golden State. Their trade target, Milwaukee Bucks center, Andrew Bogut. The only way to get him, package one of their starting guards in the deal. The choice seemed pretty obvious at the time. Get rid of the guy with debilitating ankle issues and keep the borderline all-star scoring machine. And so on March 13th, 2012, just two days after Steph played his last game of the season before undergoing surgery on his right ankle, the Warriors and the Bucks agreed to a five-player trade involving Andrew Bogut and Steven Jackson for Epe Udo, Kwame Brown, and Monte Ellis. This came as a massive shock to the NBA world as the Warriors just gave up arguably their best player and kept an unproven talent that couldn't even stay healthy. With every piece of evidence suggesting otherwise, the Warriors rolled the dice and chose to keep Stephen Curry instead of Monte Ellis, leading to a series of events that would... So they really took a chance with Steph, huh? That's tough. ...completely <coughs> alter the landscape of the NBA for the next decade and creating one of the greatest dynasties in the history of basketball. The choice was theirs and they made the right one. Except, not really. Years after this trade broke news around the league, it was discovered that the original deal wasn't Monte Ellis for Andrew Bogut, it was Stephen Curry for Andrew Bogut. The Warriors were ready to build around the trio of Ellis, Lee, and Bogut. But after completing a physical with team doctors within the Milwaukee Bucks organization, the status of Curry's ankle injuries was unclear at best. So the Bucks denied the trade and proposed a new one with Monte instead. And inexplicably, the Warriors accepted it. The same ankle injuries that gave Curry and the organization doubts about his future with the team and even his future in the league became the catalyst for one of the most pivotal trade decisions 
in the league's history. If Steph avoided those ankle injuries leading up to the trade, the Bucks would have accepted him in a package for Bogut. He would have ended up in Milwaukee, and the last 12 years of Warriors basketball that has redefined the league would have never happened. Instead, Steph would have joined the Bucks, where just 15 months after his arrival, he would have been paired with another player that might have sparked an entirely new dynasty. You know, that's what I was saying, but bro was talking about the butterfly effect, like, wouldn't that affect something? Because I was just about to ask that question, like, nah, does that mean it would be Curry and Giannis? That's nasty, bro. You know what I'm saying? It's going to take Giannis a, a few years to get really acclimated, but, you know, once he gets to that level. <laughs> but, yeah, bro, doesn't that, wouldn't that affect, affect a few more things, though? They may not get this pick in the, in, in the draft because Curry on the team now, you know? Because Curry uh, doing his thing on the team now, you know what I'm saying? I'm just saying, bro. With the 15th pick in the 2013 NBA draft, the Milwaukee Bucks. Oh, Giannis went 15, so that's not even a. Giannis. Just one season man, after their blockbuster like trade, the Bucks me. drafted an 18-year-old Giannis Antetokounmpo, which would have paired their new dynamic point guard with a young international talent they call the Greek Freak. If Steph avoided those ankle injuries, particularly this one against the Spurs that would linger and inevitably blow up his season in 2012, the Bucks would have accepted the trade offer that included him. And we may have seen an NBA featuring a Bucks team with two of the greatest players of all time. The Warriors dynasty potentially replaced with a Bucks dynasty and an entire decade of era-defining basketball erased and replaced with an unstoppable team in Milwaukee. Mm. This, this Back in 1998, really after having the so. NBA in a chokehold for the majority of a decade, the Bulls finished the their last this season together on long. top. But with their sixth championship ring came the demise of the best team in basketball. By the start of the lockout season of 99, the Bulls championship roster had been completely dismantled. Rodman was released, Pippen was traded to Houston, Phil Jackson retired. The team was a shell of itself, so Michael mm. felt like his time in the league had come to an end, and so he retired as well. Except, he oh, wasn't yeah, ready to me. leave the game. Over the yeah. years, Michael has been adamant about the fact that if the Bulls franchise brought back this team for another shot at a title, he would not have retired before the 1999 season. The one non-negotiable for Mike was that he refused to play for anyone other than Phil Jackson. But in the words of Jerry Krause, former Bulls GM, Phil Jackson could have gone 82-0 with this team, and he was still going to be let go at the end of the 98 season. This decision essentially forced Michael into retirement. But just five months after Jordan announced his second retirement, Phil Jackson was hired as the head coach of a Lakers team on the verge of becoming the next great NBA behemoth. Meanwhile, Michael, who says he was absolutely sure about his decision to retire, was not quite ready to leave the game behind. Over the next couple years, videos surfaced of Mike visiting Bulls practices, terrorizing players in one-on-ones. Clearly, I better react to those one -on I mean, those one-on-one stories. I should say, you know what I'm saying? Yeah, bro, was giving them that work, man. Every, every time it was a one -on -one story. Than anyone in the gym. Reports at the work. time even detailed Michael seriously considering suiting up and playing in Spain for half a season. But before Michael made his return in Washington, he would often visit the Lakers. During practice, before games, he would go to their games and sit courtside, something he virtually mm. never did with other teams. He would spend time with players, talking to Phil, even mentoring Kobe Bryant as he grew into a superstar. His involvement with the Lakers in the 1999 season was subtle, but had a massive effect on the team. Despite what he told us, Mike was not ready to retire in 1999. And with Phil Jackson coaching in LA, the obvious destination for the former Bulls great was to join the Lakers. But you see, the only problem was that by the time Jackson was hired to coach the team, Michael couldn't play basketball. It's been well documented that in the summer of 1998, Michael Jordan had caused severe damage to his right index finger while attempting to cut a cigar. In fact, in Jordan's retirement Damn, announcement, he mentions <laughs> that the that accident man. had severed a tendon <laughs> in his finger and that the injury would require surgery. This injury, even if Michael never retired, would have sidelined him for the entire 1999 NBA season. And by the time he was physically able to return, the team that he had spent time around, developed relationships with, and was home to the only coach that he would play for 
we're already champions, completely removing any possibility of Mike signing with the franchise since Michael refused to join a team that were already established champions. It goes against everything the man believes. If Michael Jordan never severed his finger in a freak cigar cutting accident in 1998, the nagging itch he had to return to the game might have taken place three seasons sooner with the only team Which that I even had a chance this. at signing him, the Los Angeles Lakers. What should I think about that, bro? I mean, was Mike really thinking about signing with the Lakers? Is, is bro reaching? I don't know, bro. It's the first time I'm ever hearing this, like, ever, 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 you know? But he is, this is from a butterfly effect standpoint. You, you feel me? So, ah, Instead, I his injury delayed his return to the I game and axed his chances of playing for Phil Jackson again and playing with Kobe and Shaq in a championship roster. This team could have happened. In a world where Michael Jordan doesn't get into a freak accident in the 1998 offseason, we may have seen a Lakers team featuring Shaq, Kobe, and Jordan entering the 1999 NBA season. Maybe instead of imploding a few years later, this team continues to win and stays together. Maybe Michael retires for the final time, not as a washed up Washington wizard, but instead, a Bulls and Lakers legend with three or four more rings. Or maybe Michael's title. <laughs> A Lakers uniform just look weird on Mike, no cap. A I Bulls and Lakers legend. The colors just look off. I'm just so used to seeing Michael Jordan. In the, With in the, three or four more rings. Yeah, white, or maybe Michael's tyrant red, leadership oh, drives Shaquille O'Neal out of LA know, and we never get right, that 2000s right, Lakers uh, dynasty at all. Bro. Maybe Michael's role <laughs> no. on the team greatly reduces Kobe's and we never see the true potential of the Black Mamba. And maybe mm -hmm. everything went exactly the way it was supposed to because that's the butterfly effect. When something almost insignificant spurs a series of events that leads to something much, much bigger. Sheesh. We just broke down the butterfly effect with real uh, NBA events, you know? Bro got some real good storytelling abilities, especially with these videos, you know? Uh, if y'all enjoyed, you know what to do. Click on the last reaction channel, post notification. Let me know how you feel in the comments. Um, share the video with your people, social media platforms. 93% of y'all are not subscribed. Make sure you hit that subscribe button, my brothers and sisters. I appreciate you. And I'm out of here, man.